Strange, I didn't have no hat from Brazil, even that I've been there multiple times, but I know that you love Portugal as well, so I'm wearing this one. So okay. in honor to, to you, thank you for being here. Okay. Yes. Are, are yes. you listening to me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Beautiful. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So I will share my screen. Okay, so this is my subject, the development of occlusion from birth to permanent dentition. And I think this is extremely important because we have been discussing a lot of important concepts of occlusion, but we must understand that all the things start when the baby is born or maybe even before, during the pregnancy, the things are starting to develop and uh, to create a proper environment to the de development of um, the temporal mandibular joint and the relations with Esto the quedó, occlusion. Se quedó parado en 18, pero me emite que el software no se ha so, aparentemente. I am listening to someone talking. Yes, he forgot to un to mute his uh, thing. Please go on. Okay. okay. So when we to come back to the periodontal proprioceptors and also to the proprioceptors that we have on the capture, because without them, it's not possible to uh, establish a correct relation among the mandible and the maxil in all the structures that are surrounding them. So uh, the periodontal proprioceptors, they are very specific and um, they have morphological difference. They are the only one that are uh, morphologically different and uh, created specific for one uh, site. We only have them on the periodontal ligament. The others are common to many other places, but the ones that we have on the periodontal ligament, they were made by the nature only for the periodontal ligament. And we have four different proprioceptors on the periodontal ligament, um, and they are um, responsible to the mandible posture, to the masticatory force, to the relaxation of the elevator muscles, and also to pain when we have something that can cause some damage to the periodontal ligament. So we will have the, the pain receptors uh, informing the brain. But uh, if we are talking about occlusion and if we are talking about malocclusion, we are dealing with the three first ones. The one that is called um, a spontaneous discharge that is responsible for posture. The second one that is called terminal bottom that is responsible for the masticatory force. And the third one that is called terminal ring that is responsible for the relaxation of the elevator. Okay, but that is a problem. Since they are so specific and they can even uh, feel and inform the brain if you bite a piece of hair here they can inform the brain that you are biting a piece of hair so the sensitivity of this type of proprioceptors are huge and we need them so much to create the reflex that will guide the position of the mandible but what happens if someone lose the teeth what happened to the edentulous uh, patients? What happened if we don't have this anymore? So, of course, we have to have a uh, step one. And the step one were described by Greenfield and White many years ago. And due to that, they are called GW, GW1, 2, 3, and 4. But 
uh, these uh, proprioceptors or they are mechanoceptors that are on the capsule of the temporal mandibular joint and they don't have a specific morphological characteristic. They are the same that we find in other joints all over the body. That's why I said that the periodontal ones are the most important because they were made by the nature specifically for the temporal mandibular, for the periodontal ligament. And these ones, they are like helpers. They help the uh, periodontal ones to work. And since the beginning, they were created to start to inform the, the, the brain, the position of the mandible and how the mandible is working. And why I am talking about that before starting our talking? Because this one from the temporal mandibular joint starts to work before the baby are, are born, the babies are born. During the, the intrauterine period, we start to develop this type of periodontal proprioceptors on the capsule. But when we have the baby, born and we have the first teeth erupting, the periodontal one um, gets the main hole on the command of the position and the functioning of the mandible. So it is important to give this concept before starting to deal with the development of the occlusion. So let's go on. It's important to understand the ontogeny of the occlusion, uh, focusing on the phylogeny. If uh, we understand how the animals work, uh, we can understand better how we as the most developed animal work also. That's why in the majority of the occlusion books, we have the in the first, first chapters, um, phylogeny uh, studies. So this is a skull from a rodent. So a rodent animal um, only makes this movement, forward and back, forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. It means that the temporal mandibular joint of this animal has this shape on the sagittal direction and the condyle works here, going back, going forward and back, forward and back, uh, making only protrusion and retrusion movement. So during one phase of our development, we will be like that, we will discuss. Here you are seeing on the focus, you can see the condyle and the cavity on this direction, okay? Working only like that. Here we can see a goat, okay? So remember that the goat is the ruminant and the ruminant doesn't have teeth on the superior anterior part of the um, maxi. They only have on the posterior region. And they work uh, making a very large lateral movement, completely large lateral movement. So they have a complete adaptation of the structures of the skull to make long lateral movement. And I reinforce that um, form and function are completely related. And it was um, uh, postulated by uh, Julius Wolf in 1889. And it, until now, we use this concept very strongly because form and function are completely related. So goats or ruminants, they make long lateral movements, okay? So let's go. Here you can see um, the mandible of a ruminant and you can see the posterior teeth. This type of animal make a perfect uh, balanced disocclusion, completely perfect, okay. Now we have here a horse. The horse has the touch of the anterior teeth, the four anterior teeth, and the posterior teeth. 
And this type of animal make also lateral movements, but not so large like the, the ruminants. They are herbivores, but they don't move so big like the others. Let's go. Here I have a carnivore. So this is a wild dog. You can see that we have the canines with a huge interspedation. And even the posterior teeth, the molars, they have a kind of knife surface. They don't have occlusal table. They work like that to perforate the meat. So they have adaptation of the form to work only to eat meat. And the condyle and the fossa is exactly the opposite of the rodent. So, the, the fossa is like that, and the condyle like that, and they work only in a jinglimo articulation, okay? Open and close, open and close on this direction, and have a deep situation, okay? This is another carnival, this is a feline, it's the same, very deep here, and only open and close, it's not possible to lateralize with this type of canine, okay? And here we have um, omnivore. This is a wild pig. And this animal eats every type of food. And the, it seems more like uh, humans because they have adaptation on the uh, muscles, bone, teeth, to be able to chew everything. Okay, so after coming back to the, to the, animals. We now will go to the ontogeny. Why? Because the ontogeny always uh, um, have the same pattern of the phylogeny. So we, we can make a comparison to understand better. So here we have a newborn. So what is the main movement that a newborn make? Forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. Why? to breastfeed and it makes the same movement of a rodent, okay? And create um, the shape of the temporomandibular joint that is completely flat on this moment, but it starts to have a channel is sculptured on it by the movement that the mandible go, makes forward and back, forward and back when the baby is breastfeeding. So the baby send the mandible forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. And we have a sculpture of the um, temporal mandibular joint and the condyle according to this function, okay? Good. Sometimes later, we have the eruption of the incisors. And at this moment, the forward and back movement that the baby used to make very large, it starts to go, touch and deviate, touch and deviate, touch and deviate. So we start to change the movement that we make with the mandible. So the baby changed this. And when the baby changed this, we start to have the sculpturing of the medial incline of the um, temporal mandibular joint according to this new movement that the mandible is making. So we are sculpturing the temporal mandibular joint according to the movements of the mandible. It means what? If we don't make the correct movement, we will have a wrong sculpture of the temporal mandibular joint. So it is very common to see the baby making this when we have a baby, they make this, put the, um, the, the mandible forward, put the mandible back, put the mandible laterally. What they, are they doing? They are giving information to that proprioceptors that I told you on the beginning. They are informing the brain where are the teeth, where the teeth are uh, on vestibular surface, the, the lingual surface, to 
allow the brain create the movement of the bendable according to the presence of that new teeth. So when the baby make this, it's not because they are coming to, uh, to become a class three patient. It's not that. It's because they are informing the brain where is the teeth and how will be the reflex of the movement. So it's a natural situation, okay? Well, and as soon as we have teeth in the mouth, it is necessary to give hard food to our children. Okay, we are not, um, it is not necessary to be afraid. They will not uh, suffocate with hard food. They need hard food to develop the proprioception of the teeth and the mouth to create the correct uh, reflex of moving the mandible in an adequate way. So we need to give hard food to our babies. And the teeth go on uh, erupting. We will have around um, two years all the teeth in the mouth. And we must keep giving hard food to, to our children. So popcorn is a good food. Why? Because we, they have to chew popcorn. Of course, if, when they are young, we have to supervise. We are not give popcorn for them, not taking care because they can suffocate. But uh, if we are looking, we can give, no problem. And it's a very interesting food to practicing the movement and to evolve the acquisition of the correct reflex of uh, mandible movement and chewing. They need to chew. They need to make lateral movement like the, the animals. Because um, when we are, I forgot to say, when we are like that, we have only anterior teeth. So, but we can make lateral movements very free like a goat. When we are like here, we are chewing like um, um, uh, horse or some animal like that. But when our canines come and achieve the correct position, we start to be blocked and uh, we start to chew like a carnivore. And at this moment, we will start to make the movements like carnivores, opening, close, opening, close, and making the fossa more deep. Okay. Here we have um, on this work very nice. When we give hard food for our children, we allow them to maturate the cycles of mastication. And around two, two years old, if we give hard food, they can masticate making very uh, correct cycles of mastication. If we don't give, they don't uh, achieve the maturity of the reflex and they don't chew properly. And if they don't chew properly, they don't give the correct stimulus of growing for the mandible maxil and all the stomatognathic system. Wow. So around two years old, they are like that with all the teeth in the mouth. But look, we have the canines with a huge intexpidation and they will be blocked when they close. They will not be able to make lateralization. So it's necessary to grind to green these teeth. And again, it is necessary to give hard food. If we only give puree to our children, they will not have the natural grinding of the temporary teeth. And they will be kept chewing in an open and closed movement, and we will have an impairment of the growth. Okay, so this is my grandson. He is eating corn. It's very nice uh, food for children because they have to use all the movement of the mandible to chew corn. But for each country, we have to choose what will be the best uh, food 
to offer our children because in some countries we don't have uh, corn, in others we don't have other type of food. So we have to choose what will be the best, um, not only due to the nutrients, but all, also uh, it's necessary to have a lot of fibers on the food that we offer to our children to get the maturation of the cycle of mastication. And then we will have the correct development of the occlusion. If the children chew bilateral, both alternating both sides, we will have the correct development of the occlusal plane. We will have the correct development of the mandible growth and the maxill. We will have the correct growth of the temporal mandibular joint. If we don't have, and for any uh, problem, the children develop a preferable site of chewing. So as time goes by, we will have asymmetric um, face. We will have uh, imbalance of occlusion, imbalance on the occlusal plane, and we will have also effect in all the face of the, the child. So occlusion is not only the inclination of the teeth. Occlusion means the balance of the functioning of the mouse according to the uh, um, specific functions that the stomatognatic uh, system has to make, okay? At this moment, we are making a very interesting study. We are... Um, making a correlation of malocclusion and eye problems. So we are, I published a paper about that some time ago, and now we are making an investigation uh, together with the people from Torino University, and we have a very interesting uh, result. Uh, we are writing the paper, but the wrong mastication can lead to the the, to, to can make wrong mastication can make the child more prone to some specific eye problems like myopia, astigmatism, and things like that. Soon we will have the paper. So it is extremely important to understand that to give the correct stimulus will allow all the correct growth of the face and the stomatognatic system. We also have some studies about audition and so on, but it's not the subject of this um, um, lecture now, but uh, it's important to understand that and make it clear for the audience as well. So if we give hard food, so we will have the grinding of the teeth in a natural way, it is necessary. And if we have the green C, small grinding of the incisal surface, the mesial incline of the canine, and the small tips of the cuspids. We have to have them grinded. And this will, this will allow a huge lateral movement. And then after this lateral movement, if the patient is having hard food to eat, we will have a good transversal development. And we have the opening of diastems, not only the primate diastems, but all the other diastems to, to allow the permanent teeth come and occupy the space on the arch without crowding, so naturally, okay? So if we have space, so we have a uh, type one bound arch. We will have um, less possibility of developing crowding on the permanent dentition. So if you keep going hard, giving hard food and keeping stimulating our children to eat all type of foods, we will have good um, development and we will have good occlusion. So this would be the sequence. We start with the two inferior 
to superiors and go on, and I am reinforcing again. Since the eruption of these two, we have the proprioceptors of the periodontal ligament present, okay? When they erupt, we have the, pro the proprioceptors. And this presence is extremely important to create together with the capsule um, proprioceptors, the reflex of mastication and the reflex of occlusion. The baby will learn how to close, okay? And then open and close, open and close, make lateralization and go back to the correct occlusion. If the maturity of these proprioceptors from the periodontal ligament and from the capsule uh, were able to develop naturally, okay? Well, and we have to understand also that the ontogeny of the posture is also completely related to the ontogeny of the occlusion. If the baby has uh, occlusion problems like deep bite, cross bite, we will have compensation on the body. So we have to put this in our mind. Occlusion, like Hokabado said, is not only here, it's here, here, and all the body. So we have to put this in our mind. Well, see, as time goes by, we start to lose the temporary ones. And look this baby, he's able to make lateral movements, extremely important to keep on going uh, on the correct growing. So they need to lateralize us. So the babies, the children, they need to work protrusion, lateralization with huge amplitude to be able to stimulate the correct growth. Sometimes later we lose here and we start to, to work like again like a goat because the goat doesn't have teeth here but has a huge lateral movement. So our babies at that phase, they work like goats. They start to have lateral movements because uh, the canine were grinded. So if everything uh, happened correctly, uh, the canine were grinded and now they don't block the lateral movement. So they lose the anterior teeth and they start back to make lateral movements and they will grow transversely to uh, allow the establishment of the new occlusion that at this moment is a mixed occlusion. And it will be... Patricia, five minutes, I'm sorry. No, no, we are finished, no problem. So, as time goes by, we have the molar erupting, the first molar, and then at this moment, we have the establishment of the first Wilson cube. And the Wilson cube will stimulate other muscles pulling and pushing and giving the correct stimulus, as well as the spec cube that will also come. So the mixed dentition will be like that, starting like that until we finish in uh, with the complete uh, dentition at two, around 17 to 21 years old. And here, I want to reinforce something. We are supposed to have 32 teeth. So third molar are not supposed to be discarded. If we stimulate everything correctly, we have to have space for the third molars. When we don't have space for the third molars is because we have an atrophic arts, okay? And Dr. John Mill reinforced this too much because we need to give the correct stimulus to allow the growth and to be able to get 32 teeth in the mouth because the human beings were supposed to have 32 teeth. So thank you so much. Uh, it was just some tips according to the evolution of the occlusion. 
um, here I have some addresses. If you want, you can follow me on Facebook and also on the Instagram. It will be my pleasure to discuss some issues. And thank you so much, both of thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Friends. Thank this you. This has been wonderful. Wonderful lecture. A lot of this good, uh, excellent tips that we can use. Uh, and I know some of our doctors, they do have young kids and they were looking at this to pick up some tips and you, you were, the, your lecture was full of them. Patricia, uh, you're going to be proud of a case that I'm going to show my daughter tonight. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, nice. so you got to see I'm a good fellow. I really love this. That's what I always want to bring uh, Wilma and now you, because honestly, I've been exposed to this information for